Hello, Facebook friends. I'm Lane Harwell, Executive Director of the Dance Service Organization Dance NYC, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our first ever conversation created expressly for a Facebook Live audience, and also the capstone event of a series of conversations about integrated and disability dance artistry in New York City. I'm going to turn the conversation over in a minute to the following. Kevin Gotkin, our moderator this evening. Kevin is co-director of Disability Arts NYC, an advocacy partner to Dance NYC. Alice Shepard of Kinetic Light, whose descent just finished a run at New York Live Arts. Congratulations Thank and you. welcome, Alice. And finally, Janet Wong, Associate Artistic Director of New York Live Arts. Mm -hmm. All of us here were at New York Live Arts, so thank you for hosting us today. Um, but first, before I turn it over to this group, I just want to offer some context and words of thanks. For those of you who are new to Dance NYC, the organization delivers advocacy and four core programs, action-oriented research, leadership training, promotion, and investment to empower dance makers and dance educators and strengthen the collective voice for the art form. At the core of our work is a commitment to identify, remove, and prevent inequities that exist in professional dance. And we're focused on these three issues. The meaningful integration of disabled artists, increasing racial equity, and advancing immigrant artists. Dance NYC's Disability Dance Artistry Agenda cuts across our core program areas and has helped to generate dance making by and with disabled artists, shape fund and policy development, improve management practice, and engage audiences both off and online. A priority area funded by Dance USA's Engaging Dance Audiences with the generous support of the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Um, now, uh, before I turn it over to the group, I, I want to offer a few words of thanks. First, to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for its leadership support of the series, and also to Gibney's Digital Technology Initiative for its partnership on the Facebook Live. I want to thank all of our program funders especially the Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, and National Endowment for the Arts, and all of the supporters of our Disability Dance Artistry Initiative. For their work behind the scenes, I want to thank the Dance NYC staff and volunteers, especially our Disability Dance Artistry Task Force, our Programs Manager, Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, uh, and our Equity Inclusion Coordinator, Hannah Ju, and of course, all of our speakers here today. I'm gonna turn it over to the group. I'm excited to have you all with us. I hope that you will engage, ask questions all the time. Please share the link to your friends. And this is important. Please tell us what you do to support disability dance artistry using hashtag disability dance artistry. I repeat. Please tell us what you do to advance disability dance artistry. Comment, tag us, uh, post, hashtag disability dance artistry. Thank you all. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and so I have had the pleasure of uh, moderating uh, all six of the conversations uh, in this Disability Dance Artistry Conversation Series. This one is unique because we are talking to you rather than to the you, the live audience that we've typically had. So welcome. Um, as Elaine said, my name is Kevin Gotkin. I am a co-director of an organization called Disability Arts NYC. Um, and I'm going to moderate today. So why don't we get started with some introductions and then we will jump in. So right next to me is Alice Shepard. Alice took her first dance class in order to make good on a dare. <laughs> After a performance, disabled dancer Homer Avila challenged Alice to take a dance class and she did. And she loved moving so much that she resigned her academic professorship at Penn State University to begin a career in dance. 
She studied ballet and modern with Kitty Lunn and made her debut with Infinity Dance Theater. After an apprenticeship, she joined Axis Dance Company, where she toured nationally and taught in the company's education and outreach programs. Mm -hmm. Since becoming an independent artist, uh, Alice uh, has danced in projects with Ballet, Ballet Kimry, G Dance, and Mark Brew Dance Company, uh, Dance Company in the UK, and Full Radius Dance, Marjani Forte, MB Dance, Infinity Dance Theater, and Steve Paxton in the US. As an emerging, I feel like you're more than emerging at this point, but as an emerging <laughs> and emerged uh, award-winning choreographer, Alice creates movement that challenges conventional understandings of disabled and dancing bodies. Engage, engaging with disability arts, culture, and history, she is intrigued by the intersections of disability, gender, and race. And in, in addition to her performance and choreography work, she is a sought-after speaker and has lectured on topics uh, relating to disability arts, race, mm -hmm. and dance. Welcome, Alice. Thank you, Kevin. So next to Alice is Janet Wong, who was born in <laughs> Hong Kong and trained in Hong Kong and London. Upon graduation, she joined the Ber Berlin Ballet, where she first met Bill T. Jones when he was invited to choreograph on the company. Um, in 1993, she moved to New York to pursue other interests. Um, she became rehearsal director of the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company in 1996. And since 2006, she's been the Associate Artistic Director here at New York Live Arts. 2006, uh, at the Bill T. Jones Ani Zane Company, and in 2016 is when... Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, yes, began. okay. Yeah. Yes, well, you've been here, you've been in this, I've been, you've been yes. in the world, so um, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you. So, okay, so over the weekend, we uh, Lane mentioned very briefly that um, Kinetic Light, which is Alice's company, um, mm -hmm. premiered a stunning piece of work um, called Descent, and it was just a few uh, mm -hmm. stories below us. Um, so let's start there. Let's talk about Descent. Um, Alice, do you want to, it's really hard to capture this production because it is so, there's so many features to it. Um, how would you describe it maybe for folks who haven't, uh, who don't know about it? Um, maybe, you know, start anywhere, but you could start maybe with the history. What, where did it come from? Um, what what dr drives you to to make this work? So, Descent is I I mean it started as a dance. It was simply a dance, and then it became an experience, and then it became a world. Mm. And so I think about it as Descent as a a moment to leave time, to be suspended in a different place, mm. to to take take this journey with us. And I, I would say it began with the people. Um, it began with Michael Mag, our lighting and visual designer, and it began with Laura Lawson, um, all of whom are disabled. And so that's the first thing I want to say about Kinetic Light, that the, the, the three of us in the core artistic positions are all disabled artists with an active interest in disability aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And it began with this idea of common experience of pleasure and of movement things that we do in our daily life, uh, the pleasure of rolling downhill, mm -hmm. the freedom, the recognition of ramps as architectural structures that are gorgeous until they become access ramps, in which case they're ugly, stuck around the back, and um, these kind of functional things that mm. are under design for movement pleasure, under design for social experience, um, and that's something that Simi Linton talks about a lot. Um, but it is something that basically all wheelchair users know. I've ridden ramps around the world in art museums that are these amazing things. And I wanted to be able to capture and live in this, this, this moment of movement pleasure. Um, and it came from this notion of that, that, that what is possible if you design for beauty? What is possible if you design for movement pleasure? And so the ramp was born right there um, in this idea of making a ramp designed by college students, first year college students, because uh, professionals would not, I could not find professional designers who would design for pleasure without getting tied up in notions of safety and compliance and mm -hmm. disabled people as helpless and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But these students designed for movement and pleasure and beauty. So that's how the ramp came into existence. And the rest of the piece kind of came into conversation around that. Um, we started working with the Rodin sculptures simply because um, I had seen these notices about an exhibit that was 
medicalizing Rodin's hands and diagnosing them and trying to surgically mm -hmm. correct them. And I looked at them and I saw disabled hands and mm. recognized the, the, the ways of thinking about disability representation in Western art and fell in love with, I mean, I've always had this interest, but I actually fell in love with a set of sculptures and then began instead of to try and replicate them. And a lot of people do this because Rodin has an interest in movement. There are a lot of dancer sort of installations where the dancers become these sculptures or they try to become Rodin figures. I wanted to take them and make Rodin move in this kind of way where, you know, Rodin thinks about the incomplete as an aesthetic. And I wanted to know is like, what is that becomes the disability aesthetic? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's no real reason for Rodin to be on a ramp, but Rodin happened to end up on the ramp because these were converging interests. And mm -hmm. then the set was born and the movement began, the choreography began. Michael began designing these incredible environments and sketching Rodin sculptures and making those projections become part of the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. The piece, the piece just got, and then everything else that came around it. The, the ramp is a symbol of access, and part of my work is to consider accessibility as a practice, mm -hmm. both in terms of audience, but also in terms of what does it mean to make accessibility, access, part of the aesthetic of the art. Mm -hmm. And so that got started and, and was in the work, and all of those threads mixed, and um, 18, 19 months later, we, we, you know, 18, 19 <laughs> months later, we knocked on your door <laughs> and somebody opened the lobby door. <laughs> Literally, that was two months ago. Um, yeah. 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 And, but once we came in, we, we you know, the truck just came oh, straight yeah. on. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's amazing to hear you say all of that because I didn't, I saw the show on Friday. I didn't even connect the ramp with the ramp. Hmm. Yeah, mm. and the ramp is the ramp. The ramp is the ramp. I mean, like the ramp I see out on the streets, um, mm -hmm. and this ramp that's so beautiful and sculptural. I had no, con I mean, duh, why didn't I connect that? But thank you for that. They are, they're part of that world. This is what a ramp could be. Yes. Right? This is what it could be if right. people designed for play. For Not pleasure. as an afterthought. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. right. If people design for architectural experience, yeah for pleasure, for beauty, mm -hmm. um, for inclusion, yes, and not, huh. not for a retroactive accommodation. Mm -hmm. Like what, mm -hmm. like, can you imagine how our world would be different? Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> so. so if you're just joining us, um, we are talking with Alice Shepard of Kinetic Light and Janet Wong of New York Live Arts. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, you can submit questions um, to us. I'm realizing as we're just, we're tip, you know, we're dipping our toe into what Descent is. It's in this incredible, uh, there's so many features that I think we'll get to, but um, you can help us ask about those things, right? There's like, it's such a rich production that we're not gonna be able to get it all right now, right? So ask questions um, and we will, we will get to them as we go along. So, um, but Janet, um, how, how did, uh, you kind of just uh, told us a little bit, right? Like you came to Descent uh, relatively recently, yeah. but can you share a little bit about like, what was it like this weekend, um, you know, with this, <laughs> this amazing production here? Well. Well, it happened before this weekend. I think a lot of the work has to happen before this weekend. And um, kinetic like Alice and, and Lisa Niedermeyer. Did I say her name right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Last name, I mean. Um, offered us this training called Embodied Awareness. So our staff took it. I took it myself, too, uh, to start changing how we think and exist in our bodies and in space. And um, I think that did a lot for all of us to make us come in the next day and think differently about not just ourselves, but who we're working with, who are, we're going to welcome mm -hmm. to our space wow. now and in the future. And then I'm so proud of my staff, our, my colleagues. Um, they all were so excited about uh, Kinetic Light coming into our space, and they all took it upon themselves to, uh, you know, change. And they, <laughs> they, force, they force us, I think, to really alter not just uh, the, the space that um, 
uh, that we're going to receive all these people in, but also the way we think. Mm -hmm. Like, fiscally, mm -hmm. the fiscal space has to change, right? Mm -hmm. Our space, I always thought our space is ADA compliant, but minimally. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, minimally. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to other artists um, about presenting work here, and they'll say, oh, you don't have enough, uh, it's not good enough, it's hard for us to present here, we don't have enough uh, uh, accessible seating. <laughs> we took out the whole first row of seats. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big, big change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've never done that before, mm -hmm. for example. Really? We've never, you're the first one. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, well, at least in my recent memory and also people who've worked wow. here for what, many, many years, we never removed the first row of seats. Um, before and this well this building is not that old um, oh my gosh. yeah and also like Alice was telling me and uh, people were telling me the, the, the levels of the signage has to change mm -hmm. for you know for people in wheelchairs and um, our staff went through their own training as to how to uh, traffic flow traffic flow how to mm -hmm. guide people mm -hmm. from one place to mm -hmm. another and uh, they even thought about evacuation in case of an emergency, mm -hmm. how to get people out, how to carry, how to inform, how to, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think ev changes. everyone was, yeah. and I just talked to my, my uh, colleagues uh, after the performance about their experience, and they were very, very, uh, <laughs> they were mm -hmm. glowing. They were mm -hmm. saying, that was an amazing experience. That's their first line mm -hmm. out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just want to welcome folks who are just joining us, um, especially welcoming other grantees mm -hmm. in Dance NYC's Disability Dance Artistry Fund. So um, welcome, friends. Um, uh, so we're talking about Descent, the production that was just uh, that just wrapped here at uh, New York mm -hmm. Live Arts. Um, Alice, what was it like for you to to interact with the, as we're saying like kind of surround of access right it begins mm -hmm. like the, right. the experience of coming to this production begins on the street and it comes it just it, it's a surround right so right. so what how did you design the surround how did how was it you know this is the stuff that we are just processing really right. for the first right. time since uh right. since the the run ended on saturday night so so what do yeah. you want to share oh well first up thank you Thank you. No, 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 right, because this, I mean, we've said this before, and we were saying this could have been in and out. It could have been the way you did business. We could have worked around, but, and we could have just sort of been there. But it wasn't that way. It was from you all the way through, all of your staff opened up to us and allow for this moment. Like we saw people, we did a seminar on Sunday, yeah, and we saw people who said, they had been held in this space. That the way that they were treated, that when they came, you know, you know it, it, like, it was so funny. We'd be in the dressing room and we could hear the things going on beforehand. Yeah. And we were like, this is so not about the production. This is about everyone out there. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, but, but people said that they came in and they felt welcome to the space. They yeah. felt held in the space oh. as disabled people. Mm -hmm. That being in the space that we helped create that doesn't happen. That oh. doesn't happen. And it only happened because you and your staff went like, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know that we were asking a lot to take the front row of the seats out. I mean, it just seemed normal. You took the front row of the seats out and, and then, you know, and there's this wonderful video that Lisa has of, you know, your staff like carrying out the little seats and it's like a, it's like a caterpillar of Oh seats. my God, yes. One, two, three, go, like all oh, 10 of them. Oh, <laughs> But there it was, you know, and, and you know, it seemed to us normal, yeah. but it, I didn't realize. And so mm. that's the degree of comfort mm. that, that was possible. It just seemed like you made that possible. Oh. Everything we asked for, mm. um, you made. So we didn't just do a show, like we mm. moved our culture in. Mm. Right. And, and I feel like you guys are one of the most organized companies. <laughs> she laughs. <laughs> But I, yes. I feel that, um, well, I'm not saying that the other artists are not organized. I think the Building <laughs> Jones Lines, they come in, it's very organized. People come through. Sometimes their work is not even done yet, so it's hard to be organized. Mm -hmm. But the amount of organization to make this happen on every level is astounding. And I feel like it's because you all know how much you have to deal with, and you are prepared mm -hmm. 
knowing that there may be some things that are unexpected that you have to deal with on the day of, in the moment, uh, and you're performing too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, I mean, we practiced. I, mean, I think the only way to say about that yeah. is um, my, the people on Kinetic Light who are the technical people mm -hmm. are, I have many years, many, many years, I mean, I still am an emerging artist, really, <laughs> <laughs> but the people who are on the team yeah have many, many years of experience. Yeah. And so we got, we practiced and we practiced mm -hmm. and we learned and we researched and we put everything together. And, mm -hmm. and it was like a dance, the choreography getting mm -hmm. in and out mm -hmm. of live arts, mm -hmm. brilliant. Yeah. Because because it was possible, you know, we rehearsed and went up and down and up and down and up and down before even getting into the space. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that, maybe that made a difference because then we could get in, yeah. get it done and get it out and, and right. easily. But what we didn't really anticipate was that we would leave stuff behind. And it sounds like we did leave stuff behind. And so that's really important. Yeah. That mm. feels good. Mm. That feels really good. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think we are still processing that as an organization. We're coming together on Thursday and we'll talk about it at staff meeting, uh -huh. about uh -huh. you know what last week was, how to, how we can move forward as an organization. Mm. Um, mm. And then, you know, I think it continues. It opens windows and doors and cracks mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. In within this, you know, building. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it, it, what I'm kind of getting from this is that the the comprehensiveness of the piece really is a club. It's the artistry, and it's yeah. also the venue, and it's the. I mean, it, yeah. like you were saying, I mean, it's from the front of the house staff through to you know the end of the right. piece itself. Right. Um, yeah, I just I want to. Um, I think we want to get back into the piece a little bit. I want to ask some questions about that, but. Um, feel free to submit questions um, in our live stream here. If there's stuff that you want to know that you want to ask about, um, mm -hmm. let us know. Um, so one of the, we talked a little bit about the various collaborations that you know came to make this happen, like yeah. the lighting design, the venue. Um, let's talk maybe a little bit about um, some other pieces. I'm thinking about the audio description, mm -hmm. which is a for folks who might not know what audio description is, is a protocol for making visual material accessible for blind, low vision, or non-visual um, audience members. So dance, you know, is traditionally a very visual um, art form, right? Um, audio description is this protocol that allows dance to do something totally new. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that or other um, yeah. aspects of the, of the piece? So we are at the beginning of a long conversation here. Um, and I would say uh, we were able to launch an alpha test or maybe even a pre-alpha test of our app um, and sort of mark what that might be. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to think, when we did a work in progress showing, we invited our friends and scholars from the, the blind community to come and be in the audience and give us feedback. And we also invited um, an audio describer who you know is really, really exquisite and his work is amazing and we also learned from the audience that the practice of audio description is not necessary as it's currently practiced is not necessarily the same as being in an artistic experience for everyone so and just to sort of give you a, a sort of a, an idea of that sometimes what you when you think about audio description for dance what you're getting at is a prose description of the facts of movement on stage. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and maybe if there's a narrative, some of the relationship between the forms and the lights and the stage. So you're, you're getting information mm -hmm. about what is on the stage. But the information intake is not necessarily artistically crafted. It's not a work mm -hmm. of art in itself. Mm -hmm. It's a factual mm -hmm. information transfer right. from a single perspective of a single voice. And sometimes it even a lot of the folks who are doing professional audio description don't want to think of it as an art form, right? They want to standardize it in a relatively object objective way, right? Because they that and it is important in some cases to make the argument that it is that, right? Because it can help, you know, get it like into more venues. But it also limits what artists might do with it, right? And how you actually work mm -hmm. it into mm -hmm. some pieces. Um, sorry, just to add no, in. no. That's yeah, that, that's actually mm -hmm. sometimes how audio description is. Right. Um, required in some cases, right? That you, it's almost a disembodied, I just want to know. Objective Right, facts. right. Mm -hmm. And f I think for a while in disability artistry, there's been, uh, this has been a, a tension, right? Mm -hmm. A focal point of like, what, well, why do we need it to be objective? What in fact, what are we, 
what's so scary about it not being you know subjective? Mm-hmm. What if we brought mm-hmm. it into the work, which is exactly what you've done? This is what we're, I mean, we're, and we're at the beginning of this. So we really started asking the question differently and just saying, now, what would happen if we listened to dance? And you know, this is a this is a piece that you can actually listen to, mm-hmm. and it's really, really <laughs> right because I mean, just take for a moment, um, and just sort of thinking about sound. Right. You know, for a mainstream dance audience, dance is soundless, right? Mm-hmm. You aren't supposed to land heavily. You aren't supposed mm-hmm. to bang. You aren't supposed, but there's mm-hmm. nothing you can do mm-hmm. about the ramp. The ramp is sonically alive and sonically. Present, and so mm-hmm. we were beginning to think about well, what does it mean to listen to the ramp? What does it mean to listen to the sounds that we make on the ramp? And we discovered, you know, that the two forms, the two characters, make different sounds. So you could actually track the relationship in space and sound because one character is squeaky and scrabbly, and the other character is bangy and bumpy. And you know, it's just that the movement mm-hmm. vocabulary is essential to characterization. Mm-hmm. So we began to on this journey of sonification. Um, to think through what are the sounds of the ramp, what are the sounds of the dancers, what sounds of characterization, what are the dancers' bodies, can you listen to heartbreak, can you listen to breath, can you listen to tires, um, and you know, there, and so we made a track that is one, it is, a, it is a 3D spatial recording of what it is it's like to, to, to roll on the ramp. So, mm-hmm. And then we, um, we asked other questions about sound, um, can, you, can you map? Can you, um, I commissioned a poem from disabled poet Eli Clare, and so he wrote this incredible poetry cycle, mm-hmm. and then that was set to a soundscape by Dylan Keefe, and then there was, so that was that track. Um, we also, um, we kept the, the regular audio description track, and then we asked David Linton to create a kind of psychological internal dramatic script mm-hmm. that was read by two voice artists, and so all of a sudden we have four tracks of sound mm-hmm. that are rendering this particular dance in sound in a number of ways. Mm-hmm. But I think the genius that Laurel brought mm-hmm. to this is not that you pick a track and listen to it, mm-hmm. but that blind listening practices are very different from sighted listening practices. There's a culture and an expertise there. And, and the idea is to enable people to have a choice. So you could mix the tracks and you could be listening to more than one track at once, mm-hmm. um, or you could like mix the experience of the tracks. You could have the soundtrack with the poem cycle, or the poem cycle with the, the description. And so, so in the same way that a sighted audience member chooses whether to follow mm-hmm. one dancer mm-hmm. right. or another dancer, or whether they're watching this or that, the non-sighted, blind, or vision or visually impaired audience member also gets to have a choice a chosen experience so you right. literally get to create mm-hmm. that experience in your own way so we we are at alpha test we have a lot more to learn mm-hmm. we are developing mm-hmm. the app we are developing the content we are still working on that and as we go forward in the next year mm-hmm. that's where we're headed mm-hmm. it's like boom, 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 boom. that's yeah. amazing so do they also hear about what the two performers are doing on stage at that moment right i mean yeah so you yeah. get the, the factual description okay that says, so that's you know, still in there that's still in there that's saying she's going up and down the ramp she's turning here she turns <laughs> left she turns right she raises uh-huh. her arm she does whatever it is she uh-huh. does she grabs uh-huh. her wheelchair she's on the floor right. um so that that description track is still mm-hmm, present mm-hmm. and you can listen to that and you can listen to the sound of it so you mm-hmm. can hear she turns right and you can hear right. because it's spatially sound recorded that it goes like that she goes up the ramp and you can hear and she goes down the ramp because it's time yeah. matched yeah. so it, it's okay. it's a whole environmental um, thinking but here's the other part when the app is done yeah. Laurel's been developing it open source which means it will be released free of charge to mm. the dance community no not everyone's going to take this huge track and do this kind of multiple sound experiment but it will be possible for anyone to take the app and even if they're just doing regular audio description they will have a way to pre-record that track and um, send it out into the world with their own dances Mm -hmm. so it is not just access for us it's access for the rest of the dance community as well Mm -hmm. it makes that possible because there are very few audio describers right you know yeah you go to somewhere and is there an audio if you're on tour if you're in a major metropolitan area there may be a live describer right or maybe there isn't, mm-hmm. but you can prep for that 
and you can take the app and it's free and you can have that play. And it makes it harder for folks to say that access is too hard, right? Which is Bang often, on. right? It's like often a thing yeah. that we hear in, in, yeah. in making disability arts and arts in general accessible, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, well, that would just take a lot of resources, right? And as much as we can, this is why this, you know, the production is so incredible and so comprehensive. It actually makes it harder for others to say that, well, I don't know. Well, you know, now there's actually an open source protocol, right? There's there's actually code already written for you. Place your your files in it, right? Mm -hmm. And go Place for your it. files in it. Tell your audience members to bring yeah. their headsets. Yeah. Press go. Yeah. I love it. Um, wow. Yeah. So let's, um, <laughs> let's think a little bit um, uh, about the field, um, you know, about disability dance generally. Mm. Um, there's a question we have about, um, I think this gets us into thinking about maybe what makes New York um, unique in, in the field of disability dance. Um, but this is from Shelly Wright. Um, so Shelly asked, I'm curious if you had a feedback session after performances in New York. Um, if there's a response there that might differ from the way that performances in other parts of the country would have received the work. Um, so there's kind mm -hmm. of a, a few questions there. One is about doing feedback sessions as a way to engage with the, with the work. And whether there's New York audience sensibility that might not, um, might not be the same mm -hmm. around the country. Um, <laughs> we didn't do a feedback session. We did not do a feedback <laughs> session. Yeah. Um, was that it? That was intentional. That was or, very yeah. intentional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They worked hard. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in part, in part because, boom, an hour later, done. Mm. But also because, I mean, this was very intentional on our part because this, this, I want this dance to be bodily, mm -hmm. and. There's this practice that, you know, the light comes up, five minutes, we mm -hmm. applaud, and then we all sit here in our heads. And we have to talk about it. And we right, talk yeah. about it, and that totally undoes, right. yeah. and undoes the right. work. You know, yeah. it's, 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 it's this wild thing. And, and all of a sudden, the artist is on the table to explain how long did it take to make the work, or mm -hmm. um, what were you thinking about, what was your inspiration, and, and, and yeah. the thing that happened is gone. Mm -hmm. But you did get to talk to the audience every night in the lobby. The lobby was so crowded. <laughs> <laughs> and it was part of the, it was yeah. an invitation yeah. to, to have a reception before and after the performance, which was yeah. really important, right. I think, yeah. also for the disability arts community yeah. that is spread out throughout the country because so yeah. many people came to New York to see this production. I am so amazed. And the, and that before and after too. moment was like a time to see friends and a time to really, so you kind of designed a feedback session that didn't privilege some kind of like, you know, single position, right? The intentionality. We now we know what the artist was doing, right? Actually, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the work just reverberates, and there there isn't a single center, right? right. So you kind of did a work, yeah, feedback. It's just that you decentered, right. you know, you decentered right. the places where it usually happens. I wanted um, so first of all, uh, let's deal with the cross country part of it. Yes, yes. I don't think. I mean, I think New York has this mythology about itself as the dance capital, that it has sophisticated <laughs> dance audiences and blah, 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 blah. Maybe that's true. But I want to say for this show, people came from across the US and the sophisticated yeah. conversation that happened came from disabled audience members and from people who have engaged in the work and who were there, regardless of geography. It wasn't mm. geography determined. And it did, it did happen. It happened in the lobby mm -hmm. between people, mm -hmm. before and after. Mm -hmm. yep. We set things up so that people could deal with the tactile. I mean, there was a tactile experience. Mm -hmm. um, and we offered people a chance to feel the 3D printed versions of the ramps and to, to, to get to feel some of the costumes and the textures and the things. So we set things up to, around access and accessibility, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it was interpersonal and not this top-down artist-centered. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And even beforehand, get this, we got an email from, from Lisa sent out to ev all the ticket buyers because of the snowstorm, yep. mm -hmm. but also letting everyone know about the app, about where they're going to be, what the signs would look like, the bathroom sign. Yeah. We have anyone mm -hmm. uh, as our sign, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, how to get from place to place, what does the entrance look like. Uh, if you don't know who Bill T. Jones is, Google him, he's the <laughs> big boss here. <laughs> like, that was so amazing to me to, to read. Like, 
just all the information sharing, you think that you guys think on so many different levels all at the same time. And learning, and, and for us to learn, oh, that's what accessibility means. <laughs> And more demonstration that the artistry and the venue become, you know, it all becomes yeah, part yeah. of the work, right? I mean, right. Bill T. Jones is a is a major figure who who um, has early on recognized disability as an innovative force in, right. in, in you know so it's like we're talking about the venue right as a venue but right. the venue is also crafted and built by someone who has for decades really right been working with disability in the dance field and and supporting that you right. know as an innovative well, force that may be an exaggeration of what we've done we, we're just learning but uh, everything is delicately interconnected mm -hmm. like, I am connected to Axis Dance Company, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and hence is connected to Alice indirectly, mm -hmm. and then yeah. here we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why I, you know, noticed, I, I, uh, it was Carla Peterson. She emailed me in <laughs> December saying yeah, that. Carla. <laughs> Carla, go see um, the showing. At, it was at Gibney, right? Mm -hmm. Gibney, you, had yeah. a, you have a dip residency there. Thank you, Gibney. Thank um, you, Gibney. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And, and I couldn't go, and then that's how, oh, who is this person? Who is this artist? What is this work? Well, Carla Peterson go, said, go see this. And then you knock on our door saying, <laughs> asking if uh -huh. we can. Can we, can we come in, please? <laughs> yeah. so, yes, uh -huh. <laughs> come on in. So everything is interconnected. And Bill made a work in 1999, I think, on yeah. Access Dance Company, and it was a big learning process for us about how... Um, New York was so not accessible <laughs> for mm -hmm. people in wheelchairs, especially going, getting around. And then when we were working in Oakland and Berkeley, it's such a different mm -hmm. uh, landscape mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. It is right. It really is. Yeah. yeah. And 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 for for me working, I was Bill. I was assisting Bill in that creation. Um, wow. Uh, and meeting Judy and Bonnie and that crazy wow. crew. Uh, wow. <laughs> the wait, wait, stop. This is history here. This is disability <laughs> dance history here. Oh, my God. Uh, and Bill, <laughs> we worked them so hard. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, Bill, one of the first things that Bill said to Judy when, when uh, we arrived was, I'm not going to make a piece about your disability. I'm going to make a piece, not even celebrating your disability. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a piece celebrating you all. Yeah. It's going to be about your fierceness, your movement in time and space. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, you're you know, we're not going to celebrate how brave you are, how courageous you are. You know, getting up in the morning is brave and courageous. We know that. Mm -hmm. We want to look at you. We want people to look at this work and say, wow, this is a great dance. Mm -hmm. And not say this is a great disabled dance mm -hmm. or, or mixability yeah. dance. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, one of the goals that we went in with. And it was such an ama amazing experience. <laughs> and I know when we came back maybe a month later or three months later, right before the premiere. Was it the premiere? It was in Boston. Why was I in Boston? It was in Boston. We flew there. We were all there. And I like they have funny stories about flying. Right. I'm sure you have too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and of course, Bill, being Bill, he made a lot of changes in that rehearsal before um, oh my God. the premiere. And they all freaked out. <laughs> oh, my God. It was really funny. And this has been the, the dance umbrella, the big, the big thing yeah. that happened in Boston. Was that 1996? No, it was later than that. It was like 1999, okay. I think. Yeah, okay, I could so have gotten my dates mm -hmm. wrong, but 1999, definitely. But it was an, so th yeah, it was an amazing experience. I also worked with uh, Heidi Latsky Dance. Mm -hmm. Heidi, I hope you. Hi, another, Heidi. another one of the the dance <laughs> yeah. disability artistry grantees, yeah. and our actually our first uh, conversation that we had oh, in yeah. the series. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I yeah. rambled. No, this is great. No, this is, this is, this is this fabulous. Is this, this is our history. This is how. And I think that's the other thing I want to say about this. There mm -hmm. is a history. There is a field. We yeah. are interconnected. And we don't just like pop up like these special little flowers, yeah. right? This yeah. is a serious field. 
with serious mm -hmm. work happening yes. mm -hmm. with connections across the dance yeah. world. And so that's important to name that yeah. right here. Yeah. yeah, we have some fabulous questions I want to oh. get to. Um, I just want to welcome folks who uh, have, are just joining us. Um, we are talking with Alice Shepard of Kinetic Light and Janet Wong of New York Live Arts. Um, so I, I do just want to, oh, and you can submit questions. Please submit questions. We're going to get to some really fabulous ones in a second. Um, and also, if you're um, sharing your thoughts about um, disability dance artistry, you can use the hashtag disability dance artistry to, uh, to tag your, your stuff so we can see it. Um, um, Alice, you know, we, we're talking about the history of, of this field. Um, and, you know, some folks don't use the word, the phrase disability dance, right? It might be physically integrated dance. Um, and I know that, you know, uh, some companies, uh, their choreographic kind of drive is to think about how all of the bodies on stage can coordinate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there are techniques of, you know, translating different mm -hmm. kinds of uh, movement between mm -hmm. able non-disabled or uh, disabled uh, dancers. Um, your choreographic style is quite different. Do you want to maybe talk to us about, you, yeah. know, you come from so many of these amazing trailblazing disability and integrated dance companies um, and st you started your career with them and yeah. then also now you're doing something new as an independent artist. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about how your work is unique in the field? Well, let's 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 start talking about me. I think I can do this in three points. <laughs> like I, think, I think I got this. Awesome. All right, like I think I can do this in a couple of sentences. Okay, so one, I mean, I think the central question is what is the value of disability hmm. in movement generation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in the art form? Um, and so I think that uh, there are several approaches. And one is that you can think about adaptation and translation where you take mainstream dance vocabularies and you, you place them on a disabled dancer who then adapts them according to impairment or translates them to their version of it. And so you have a relationship between um, sort of translation and, and ad adaptation as one form of movement generation. Mm -hmm. um, and we can think about that as, as one way of practice. We can also think about um, what does it mean to have, um, to present on stage uh, what I would call disabled movement. Mm -hmm. And that is to just, when you present the movement of a body or the experiences of cognition and sensory impairment, sort of unfiltered by reference to mainstream dance practices, you mm -hmm. can do that. Mm -hmm. And you can also think about, uh, and this is where I, and, and I think the field of physically integrated dance is using both of those techniques uh, a lot. And uh, what we're seeing here is an art form that is, and here I need to take a sort of a side detour, mm -hmm. but physically integrated dance is its own art form, right? It is not physically mm -hmm. integrated dance if you just drop someone who is disabled in a ballet. That's not physically integrated dance. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not. Physically integrated dance is about the art form of crafting the relationship of non-disabled and disabled mm -hmm. dancers. Mm -hmm. um, you can, for example, and then on top of that, you can think about the relationship of physically integrated dance and other movement styles. So what if you are doing physically integrated hip hop or physically mm -hmm. integrated mm -hmm. ballet or mm -hmm. physically integrated mm -hmm. West African dance, right? So that, that there are ways in which, you know, conventional mainstream non-disabled styles mm -hmm. and vocabularies are there and are accessible. Right but they're not necessarily connected to physically yeah. integrated dance, and it's not integrated if you just drop someone in. So there's a, t there's a practice of how is the movement made, right. um, what is the value of disability, what is the relationship mm -hmm. to mainstream dance forms. Those are all things that are up for negotiation. Mm -hmm. In my own work, um, and we're still looking for language on this, right? We're mm -hmm. still looking for language. Working with disability dance, it is um, made by disabled artists, performed by disabled artists, and three, uses disability aesthetics, culture, history, and politics as source resource areas, mm -hmm. but also urgently interrogates intersectionality uh, with regard to race, mm -hmm, gender, mm -hmm. queerness. So there's a kind of a, um, a, an approach to disability and an insistence on intersectionality. Mm -hmm. um, so those two things go together. 
performed by disabled artists, made by disabled artists, using disability art, culture, history and politics as a resource area with a, with acute and urgent reference to intersectional identity. Mm. That's a lot of language. Yeah. But that's how I that's that's what I'm working right. with. It's well, fabulous. In your in your piece maybe I haven't seen enough, but the kind of partnering that you guys were doing, you and Laurel were doing, was a contact improvisation mm -hmm. in, in wheels as um, weight sharing, sus you know, uh, mm -hmm. suspending each other's weight counter pull, all of that yeah. stuff. That's a very um, specific language. It is a very yeah. specific, uh, yeah. And, and uh, that's the thing, right? When we want to create our own world, we have to create that language that comes into it, otherwise we're using the same old language, meaning movement, to, to express mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. uh, world, which doesn't always work. And I think that's an important moment, right? Yeah. Contact improvisation was one of the ways in which the disabled body right. would came into the mm -hmm. world of dance back in the 1980s and in the early 1990s. Contact, <laughs> yeah, but, but this is our history, mm -hmm. right? The language of pedestrian movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if we don't necessarily like the language of untrained dancers or, mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or non-dancers, yeah. but the, the permissibility around movement generation mm -hmm. yes. is one of the ways in which mm -hmm. disabled dancers came into the field. And now yeah. contact improvisation techniques are part of what enables us to do what we do. Yeah. Oh, mm. right. That's, that's how we amazing. And well, another, you know, uh, connection that we have, like we have, is, uh, <laughs> we have. well, that's how Arnie Zane started dancing. He was a photographer. Mm -hmm. We just celebrated his mm -hmm. um, anniversary yesterday, a launch of his anniversary. His anniversary actually exactly this week of his passing. Uh, but that's how he started dancing. Um, Bill convinced him to join him in a contact improv workshop mm -hmm. uh, in 1972, <laughs> 73, um, taught by Lois Welk. And he said, sure. And he, he went, put on some sweats, and took that workshop, mm -hmm. and he got hooked. Yeah. He said he was like a uh, dropping acid. <laughs> <laughs> as freeing as right. that. Um, yeah, those those yeah. kind of contact points. Yeah. I mean, I feel like disability artistry in particular mm -hmm. is interested in those contact points because as Descent put on display for us, there are so many forms of collaboration, right? Like there's, mm -hmm. there's not a single mm -hmm. discipline at work, right? Mm -hmm. When you're making a comprehensive, right. accessible, right? It's not just dance. And that's mm -hmm. true for, you can't just make visual art, right? From divining, as you're saying, the, the history yeah. and politics of disability culture, um, it becomes more than just that discipline. And in some ways, yeah. I think we can think of it as anti-disciplinary. Um, but yeah, so so that kind of gets us to a, a great question from Douglas Scott, another disability dance okay. artistry grantee. Hi, Doug. Um, so he asks about um, uh, having creative partners across the country. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so many of the collaborators actually... I, are, is, are any of the, the main collaborators in the same city? <laughs> no. So so no. on every no. element, right, no. not only is putting all them together such a challenge, but each of the main players, I mean, Laurel not being based in New York and mm -hmm. Sarah Hendren in Boston who was designing the ramp and Michael mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. in Oregon. So can you talk a little bit about maybe the process? Like how did you coordinate all these collaborations over such uh, intense time and space challenges? All right. So... I actually learned to get a little bit organized. <laughs> um, Skype. Um, I mean, let, let's just sort of uh, figure this out. So Laurel's based in Atlanta, where she dances with Douglas Scott and Full Radius Dance. And that's her primary dance home and dance community. She commuted from Atlanta to New York and from Atlanta to uh, San Francisco. We had... Um, we had a warehouse in Redwood City for one, for three months, a three month period. We had a leaky warehouse and the ramp was in the warehouse and we would come in and like sweep the rain and the dust and the roof off there. But Laurel <laughs> flew the miles. Wow. Yeah. And, and so that was one way that, because we had to get the ramp, we couldn't rehearse without the ramp, and so Laurel generously yeah. did that commute. And she would often do things like leave on the four o'clock flight and fly back to Atlanta, getting in time to be back at full radius dance rehearsals wow. in the morning uh, like, uh, the, so for that. So that process was one of intense, uh, uh, real intensity. Uh, Michael and I, we would just rehearse by Skype. Hours and hours and hours of Skype rehearsal. Wow. 
and you know going through descent video we would be literally screen sharing and looking at the video and looking at this and trying to communicate that <laughs> and sending messages backwards and forwards and emails and texts and documents and spreadsheets but that's how that got built Whoa. literally over the literally over the web um, Sarah and I had a different process. Um, Sarah generously invited me out to Olin College and I met the students and um, we, I did a lecture and a performance there. We had a micro residency mm. and then that too was Skype. But, and then I love this, they, um, they asked me to get Sculpey and over Skype, they were teaching me how to make the red model ramps over with Sculpey. And I was building these kind of baby ramps over wow. Sculpey. And like, this is the blue piece. And then you have to coil it around this way and put it down <laughs> like that. So that's how the ramp got wow. built. Wow. And then Laurel and I went back to Boston, to, to the Needham actually, to, to, to actually for a three or four day residency when they built the prototype ramp. Like we went out for a week and played on that for three or four days. That was incredible. Amazing. That's how that part got done. Um, Oh yeah, Eli and I, we commuted by, we, we uh, worked by text, um, <laughs> that's how it happened. Oh, and we, got, we, we, got, we worked by text, and so that was how that part got done. Um, oh my God. Yeah, no, I mean, I really feel like digital, the, the digital communication practices wow. were the center of all of this. And we wow. didn't meet, um, we didn't meet in person, the full team, until August when uh, we had a Mansi residency and Carla Peterson brought um, Michael, Laurel, and I together. That was our first meeting. Otherwise, everything had sort of flown uh, through me. And then the rest of the team didn't actually meet until the show. Mm. Everything was done virtually. Wow. It was uh, unreal, but at the airfares. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I got miles. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm just tired just hearing that. <laughs> You know, for, for, for me, when I hear that, I go, oh, that person's here, that person's here. Okay, that's not going to work out. But you're not even thinking that it's not going to work out. It had to work out. It has to work out. Yeah. It had to work out. Yeah. It just had to work out. Right. And for us, like, when, when people are so far apart and everyone mm -hmm. is apart, it's cost prohibitive and, and also difficult for the process. Mm -hmm. But you're not afraid of anything, it seems like. Oh, well, I mean, I'm afraid of my calendar, and I'm also bad with time zones, right? Because you put things in, and then you change time zones, and you're like, oh, is that an English time zone? Oh. Or is that a New York time zone? Oh, oh. you have to disable that thing in your calendar. <laughs> well, no, I had to learn to use it. I actually had to uh, learn to manage the time zones. Oh. That was the big, the biggest challenge was time zone management. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. Yeah. Um, can I just ask a really specific question? Did you have any central project management software or were, were each of these things coordinated in like Google Drive over here and like email folders over there? Was there one software that you use? Um, so this is one of the geniuses of Lisa. Um, Lisa, when Lisa joined, she took one look at this swirl of chaos and she was like, <laughs> <laughs> she managed to bring us together mm. yeah. in a way that was really mm -hmm. much more mm -hmm. focused and uh, we ended up using Asana but I'm not yeah. sure that that's the right one for us yet. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 No but I think it's it, what you're saying is a continuation of the artistry itself right that there's no central site right so in some ways right. it totally central. makes sense that you've been you know, doing all of the collaborations in totally yeah. different channels because it's not mm -hmm. like there's one central yeah. right. part of the art. The artist doesn't sit necessarily in one place. So, but I think I think a lot of folks are kind of wondering, right? How do you man? And it'd be great to to hear more, and maybe later when why Asana is or isn't the project management. What kind of tools do dance makers doing all of the coordination of access at the center of artistry, right? How do we how do we manage it best? But well, I, the, the easy answer to that is. No, there's no one tool. Yeah. Like Mariah mm. and I continue to collaborate on Google mm. and for mm. the project management stuff. Lisa and I collaborate and Lisa and Mariah co collaborate on um, through Asana. But there's a there there's just no one tool. Yeah. It's yeah. it's we're not there yet. Yeah. And maybe we shouldn't be there. And that's for everybody, all people making work. <laughs> How do we coordinate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a huge yeah. mess, huge. Right. Everyone wants I, to know what's I the know. best. I want to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so let's let's actually talk about Lisa for a second. Lisa Niedermeyer, who um, came on um, not because you were starting your own company, right, which is often where 
choreographers go. You were to start your own production firm, like production <laughs> company. Um, Not even that, though. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's, this has been a journey. Like we, I don't have a business model that I think mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. um, recognizable yet under tra traditional dance maker structures. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So um, Mariah Weathers is our project manager, mm -hmm. my project manager and tour coordinator, and, she, and that's part of that work process here. And she's also functioning as a co-producer. Lisa is doing some of the production mm -hmm. work as well. Mm -hmm. So Lisa and Mariah work together. This is not a business model that is known yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we finished building the infrastructure. And I think that was the other thing that we said to each other all year, was we are flying this as we're doing it. We're flying the plane and building the plane at the same time. We're flying the plane, we're building the plane, we're yeah. flying the plane, yeah. we're building. And Lisa and Mariah together held, just held it. Mm -hmm. um, because um, I don't, I'm just not sure that we're, I'm ready to say this is the infrastructure yeah. of this company. Right, right. I don't have yeah. it yet. But whereas a lot of other business models, maybe in the dance world, think of a lot of that stuff as purely logistical or like, oh, that's the production stuff that's like ancillary or that makes the artistry possible. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for your work, that is, that's all part of it, you know? Yeah. And then that gets sourced into, you know, the, the work itself, right? So when we see this beautiful, ramp you know that is non-compliant and you know what i mean like we're so we're we're thinking about so much that has actually maybe been part of the product the assembly and disassembly of all of these parts in each time I mean, the, it's been shown the ramp has its own coordinator mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i mean <laughs> no i mean mm -hmm. the ramp has its own travel logistics assembly crew mm -hmm. coordinator yeah. stephanie mm -hmm. burns arrow yeah. is mm -hmm. you know yeah because okay. the ramp is its own person right and well. Lisa has been our point person mm -hmm. and has mm -hmm. guided us through this process while you're working your artistic <laughs> side too, right? Mm -hmm. And she's been so amazing that be, you know she can answer any question you you give her and, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. she's been there with such a calm presence. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Um, yeah. So here's a question that I think we'll I maybe ask again at the end, but it's a pressing question for all of us. Yeah. Um, Reshma Patel asks, will be will there be any more performances of Descent? What is next since since the run was sold out here at Newark Live Arts? I mean, there were so many folks I know in New York who couldn't come to see it. This is a this is a I, question. So many people are going to hang on your every word. How can we how can we see the work again? M maybe. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about this yet. We, we, we started talking about uh, what would it mean to bring it back again next season. How, yeah, so uh, ha we haven't really had the conversation. Yeah, we were going to wait till after the performance. This is yeah. breaking news here. So if we, you I want to, to I'm see like it. a journalist now. <laughs> no, I get, I to, nothing, I get nothing. to report to you at home. No, I'm all I can yeah. say is there it. You will see, it will happen again. Right. It will happen again. Yeah. I'm not sure where or how. We're taking it on yeah. tour. Right. Um, so that's good, that's... Yeah. Can we ask folks maybe who are watching from other cities who would love to see Descent come? Ooh. I mean, I mean, you know, we're, we've been talking about all that goes into this, but in terms mm -hmm. of setting up your tour, like how how what are the considerations? What do you go through in in making Descent, you know, a touring production, and how might I'm, I'm thinking about how my <laughs> folks might all right might yeah like what right, what, what are you looking to first right to to secure this as a all viable right. production? So there are a number of things we have to think about structurally, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the theater has to hold the ramp. Yeah, and newsflash shepherd the theater has to have a ceiling high <laughs> enough to hold the yeah. projections um we're looking for venues that are accessible front of house yeah. back and backstage mm -hmm. but i think actually what we're looking for is a relationship with a presenter who's mm -hmm. like i i want this i want this experience mm -hmm. i want this culture i want this moment i want to see this happen and then i think the the way forward is that Mariah Weathers' uh, information is on our website, and you contact Mariah, and mm -hmm. off we go. Yeah. I mean, and yeah. I and I think this is a is a is a complex production. It's a huge production, yeah, but there are partnerships, the ways of building it forward, and I think it's really about the question of, is this for you? Can we be in relationship and conversation? Mm -hmm. And right. then. 
And then and then Janet opened the door and she do <laughs> the ramp rolled on in. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, exactly. So we'll talk about it after Alice has recovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Fabulous. Yeah. Um so here's a question that we um I think will get us to thinking more about the field, right? And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned earlier, um, you know, I mentioned in your bio that you're an you're animated by the intersections of disability, gender, race, queerness. Mm -hmm. um, could you? T we could see it that happening in descent. But do you want to talk about that? I mean, how does dance artistry, you know, mm. think of and take? Uh, the intersection, these intersections as the center. Because, you know, we should just name, right, that disability artistry in general, disability dance, is not very racially diverse. Um, and there's many ways we could think about why that is. I mean, this this, this series, this fabulous series um, from Dance NYC is itself um, quite white. Um, and 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 so here's here's a piece that is doing what a lot of disability dance has not done, which is to, to think about dance, uh, disability and race and gender and queerness all together. Which, if you know some of the kind of dramaturgy w between Andromeda <laughs> and Venus in this production, you get it all there. Um, so, mm -hmm. do you want maybe want to comment on that to, to talk about how you think about these intersections and? Yeah, yeah. Um, messily, I mean, let's be honest about it. Messily, uh, I want to take a moment to talk about the gap between lived experience, uh, personal identity, and work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the one thing I want to say initially is I'm thinking conceptually and abstractly. Um, I am not trying to represent who I am on stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, yes, I live at the intersections of those identities, but the the work itself is is conceptually thematized. Uh, it, so it's thematized conceptually, but it's also in the process, um, mm -hmm. trying to build a, a process that um, honors these identities and honors the lived experiences of the identities in the process of making the work. So it's, um, it is, there are, there were, there's my lived experience, but there's also a process that is accessible, mm. that honors mm. race, that mm. honors mm. queerness, and then there's the work itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, um, yeah, it's it's also about thinking. For me, um, the disability message is, is clear enough. I mean, we had a seminar on Sunday and we were talking about disability and sexuality, and many people in that room recognize that the level of conversation is disabled people are unsexy, and this mm -hmm. piece, you know, this piece doesn't even mm -hmm. make make the argument that disabled people are sexy, it jumps straight to doing like, <laughs> into, you know, to, to, right? I mean, so the, the move that I am making on all of these um, fronts is not to argue for equality, equity, or inclusion. Um, there, are other, there, there are other artists who are in that mm -hmm. field making those arguments about, Yes, disability can be sexual. Yes, disability is racialized. Yes, racialized. Yes, race is disabled. You know, th th there are. But my my question is to assume those as, as facts and to ask what happens mm -hmm, next. Mm -hmm. um, and so, processually, and conceptually in the work, these are just facts of of existence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Love, yeah, there's so much to, to think about and, and how to also like in the support of the of through training, through education, through audience engagement, critical curatorial literacies, right? How do we get um, how do we get disability artistry to be understood beyond the ways that you kind of mentioned, it often gets right. limited, right? So disability artistry um, as seen as only political, right? That might be something mm -hmm. that drives an artist right, to, right. To, to think about protest as a form, but mm -hmm. it, if it is an automatic assumption, right, that that's what it's doing, or right. that it's only about lived experience, or it's only therapeutic, right? The, um, right. Yes. The new right. forms beyond those limitations are, are really what what you're up to and what we need to do in so many of the kind of the ecosystem. So are you saying that eventually or soon we want to take that disability lens off 
or, or yeah, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting we question. Take us out of the, that little corner called yeah. this, or we want mm. yeah. always think, to yeah. highlight that. I think a lot mm. of us who work in disability uh, artistry don't think of disability mm. as small. You know, yeah. disability mm -hmm. is very large, right? It's it's like a yeah. way of thinking about the world and. So I think it's not so much that we would come out of a, spe a specific location, yeah. but that that location gets centered, you know, and is understood as it's interesting that some of the companies in this conversation series have talked about when they go to try and get funding or work with presenters, sometimes they're like, like told like, well, we already have someone thinking about disability on our program this season mm -hmm. or our, like there's this kind of like yeah. the, the way that ableism and many forms of domination kind of happen is that we're thought of as small right like the work that is done in the name of disability but actually I think that's that's very large work like that work can encompass so much that isn't already named as disability and so I think a lot of folks instead of saying let's broaden and leave disability behind you actually broaden by using disability I mean that's my perspective what's your what's your thought about it my well my perspective is that I mean I think this is the, this is why I had my hand on I was <laughs> I was thinking um do we I mean I think we should have space for all of those forms mm -hmm. of art mm -hmm. um, and that they should be recognized as um, I think as artistic production with aesthetic value I think work mm -hmm. that is tied to social justice messaging is not often accorded its own aesthetic merit or mm -hmm. read in an mm -hmm. interpreted in an aesthetic way right. and maybe some of it isn't even constructed in that way but we have to allow for that to be in the field and to, uh, as artists, be involved in conversations about, you know, it is a, the, this is one way of producing work, this is another way of producing work, mm -hmm. this is another way of producing work. And then someone else is going to show up and say, well, you know what, you had your three ways, this is the fourth way and this is the fifth way. And, and that is about the healthy debate and growth of a field that has serious artistic merit. Um, what I think is, the difficulty is us being hemmed in mm -hmm. by the conversation of we have to prove we can dance, right? Mm -hmm. That you know that that notion of we are proving that we can dance, we are still proving that this is an art form, we are still proving that we have merit, we are still proving that we have value. If we're caught in that dynamic, mm -hmm. and then we aren't really in the work. Mm -hmm. And I want to be in the work. I want to be held in conversation by someone who is making work from lived experience and, and who is challenging the notion of aesthetics and I want to challenge them about the value of lived experience and we can't have that conversation or maybe we can but we are not having it if we're constantly trying to say to the outer world you mm -hmm. know this is still an art form this, mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. you know if you mm -hmm. present axis does that mean you shouldn't present full radius dance no you should present both you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you should be able to have a series you should be able to have a conversation what if you present me and dancing wheels how do you present me and jess how do you present like what if this mm -hmm. six series traveled <laughs> right like is there okay okay yeah. challenge to the world i don't know who's out there <laughs> is there a presenter who is willing to represent right all six artists in this series. Mm. That's a fabulous challenge. Right? We need, we need a hashtag so, to for the that internet. Challenge. All six DDA. <laughs> all six DDA grantees. Yeah, so they were Heidi Latsky dance, yes. full radius, access dance, um, dancing wheels, mm. just Curtis Gravity, the and Kinetic Light. Did Is we get them all six? six? Ding, yeah. ding, ding, ding. I need like an effect, a special <laughs> effect soundboard. Um, but, but, I'm, but I'm serious, right? right? Yeah. Like, what does it yeah. mean to do that? And why has this been one of the only places where all six are named together, right? right. As a series. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, as we will right. say in a second, too, like that is just the Dance NYC, uh, in, you know, strategic um, equity work, right? right. Um, but it's so rare. And they all came through New York, right? What if we, what if we did, um, you know, other... One one venue, right? One one, venue. Right. <laughs> one program, one season. Wouldn't that be amazing? And you know, we need for that funding for that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. But but and or also, like, what does it mean to not present these six mm -hmm. and to find six mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. artists, mm -hmm. and present them? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. this is not a canonical six. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So a, a question to follow up on that. Um, you, so, you know, Jenny, you're saying we need funding for that. Um, what else? I mean, what does the field need now? I mean, w- what do funders need to do? And if we need to, mm-hmm. you know, maybe make an agenda for, for the funders who have been supporting this work and want to continue, what do we think from, you know, from the presenting side, from right. the venue side, from the from the company I f- side? I feel like I'm not so equipped to speak on that. <laughs> I actually <laughs> thought, said to Alejandra that I am not qualified to be on this panel and and she convinced me because she's such a great salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like um, Dance NYC has done so much work on this and they can really speak to how, what the field needs, what where we are at this moment and what we can do moving forward. But um, I think these conversations are very important to have to, just today mm-hmm. I'm learning so much mm-hmm. already of, mm-hmm. about, you know, this field um, and then there's that thing called the larger field the field that right. You, right and how does it sit within that how can we be more integrated yeah. and oftentimes it's um, just be- becoming aware of being aware <laughs> um, and yeah. of course funding always help if someone if we can put together something you know like you said presenting all six a little festival mm-hmm. um, and someone like some foundation can, you know, or, or several foundations come together and fund this, and and um, that will really help towards mm-hmm. encouraging presenters to, you know, present all six together, a little festival, and then have it travel around the country. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Tour bus. Tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. Right. Yeah. But I always think in for the, you know... Children, when do when do people have access to movement? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I have, I was saying to Mark Brew uh, a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, a month ago. Um, I don't see a lot of people in wheelchairs um, around. I don't see a lot of kids around. I don't see any kids around. Is it because I don't pay attention mm-hmm. to them? I have one little girl in my in my building who is in a wheelchair and she's now no longer a little girl. She's an adult now and she's the only one in my building that I see mm-hmm. not regularly because mm-hmm. I don't really see her much. She, um, and we don't even have a ramp and, and my our board has been talking about putting in a ramp for her. So getting up and down those few steps is a big problem uh, all the time. But when do they come into movement-based work? When mm-hmm. when do they have access mm-hmm. to that? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. When do you come into dance? Not till someone mm-hmm. gave you a challenge. <laughs> right. Right. Well, yeah. um, so we need education, yeah. right? We need schools. We need training in, in schools and education. The conversation there is beginning, has begun. People are thinking about it. Will it be sufficiently funded? It might be sufficiently funded in New York. Will it be sufficiently funded nationwide? Don't know. But we need education level. You need to be able to have training at the university level, the conservatory level. Like, really? Can I apply to uh, get an MFA in dance? Maybe. Yeah. But if I hadn't done what I have done, could I have applied to get a BFA and be accepted? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. And we need teachers. Yeah. Um, who can teach us, yeah. you know, the, I mean, not just adaptation or translation or any of the other gazillion skills that you need to be an incredibly effective artist, but someone has to teach us how to use a wheelchair. So right. who's doing that? Yeah. Who's teaching us how to use walkers and crutches? And, you know, so there's that. We need teachers, we need teaching, we need classes, we need experience, we need training. And it's not just in New York. This has to be nationwide. Right. So, and we need to be able to nurture independent artists. Right. Uh, the UK has a really mm. strong and rich mm-hmm. independent artist mm-hmm. scene that is funded, which b- provides for a really dynamic relationship between their portfolio companies and their independent artists. Artists come and go, they have careers, they have pathways. You know, the US doesn't have that. Like, you cannot tell me that there aren't disabled da- dancers in Arkansas or Oklahoma. Like, where are the companies? Where are the artists? Where is this? It's not just... So, yeah, we need... And, of course, that's not possible to be done here. What we can do is take care of what we can take over in New York. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this conversation with Dance NYC and the task force has begun to change that landscape. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. really seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Do do I'm since you mentioned the UK, I'm thinking about that as a mo- model where some of the support for disability artistry is nationally right is nationally unlimited. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. uh, fund and, uh, and a few other fabulous nationwide organizations there. Um, I wonder, yeah, I wonder why the U.S. hasn't had that already. I mean, is it the, <laughs> is it the Paralympics? You know, I mean, there, there, was, a, there was some, um, I think, some ways in which the Paralympics in, in London, you know, really did spur mm-hmm, some funding mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. the incredible artistry on display in the opening ceremonies. But, mm-hmm. um, but you know, yeah, wh- what would it mean to build a national, uh, you know, support for disability artistry? How might the UK be a model if you, you know, since you worked a little bit in the UK, as you both right. have worked in London, um, but I don't know. I can't see that being funded. Oh, p- forget <laughs> <laughs> right? any so, art, yeah. right. from any art. So, yeah. so then the question is, okay, Funding, we, we know we're not going to get national priority funding, maybe. Mm-hmm. What do we do locally? How can those who are already have access to pipelines and funding and structures and spaces mm-hmm. and time make space open doors and encourage? Because it is this is the way that we diversify the field because it's, it's you know, that's how you get from, you get diverse dancers, you get diverse leaders, you get diverse mm-hmm. administrators. Yeah. That's how we get, we have to literally dig in in the cities that we live in. Yeah. So yeah. the question is, will the dance organization and those who, who hold spaces in the world of dance do do yeah. this? Yeah. Will they have yeah. conversations? Yeah. Will they look around? Will they teach and invite students into the classes? Mm-hmm. Is that possible? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what does it take to do that? Yeah. Like yeah. Where is the will locally if you can't structure things nationally? And we can't get stuck um, at the level of, well, there's no funding, so we can't yeah. do anything. Yeah. Right. right. There c- has to be a will. Yeah. yeah. And then find a way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's a, an, another great question here about um, funding for uh, the art making and funding for access. I mean, in some mm-hmm. ways, you know, we've talked about in this, in Descent, uh, those things are not necessarily so separate, right? Our access is mm-hmm. the artistry. but. Um, you know, on, on a logistical level, often we find that um, funding, you know, doesn't take into consideration that there might be unique access costs uh, mm-hmm. for disability dance companies, right? right. Um, that if you don't think about those, that means that disability dance companies that get the funding start at a loss, right? Because the, the money that for other companies is, you know, just going towards the art making or things that don't the world that is, it's already been designed that is free for them needs to, it becomes costly right. for disability dance makers. And so, right. um, yeah, I mean, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about maybe the locations of, mm. of funding, maybe separating them, right, for, for access costs that might be um, standalone uh, funds that would not then uh, put disability dance makers at a loss. Mm. Right. I don't, th- for, for our theater, yeah. um, I don't think we spend a lot of money on converting anything. They they're all low cost. We're not. We didn't build a whole. We didn't have to build a whole ramp right. or, right. or anything right. like that. Right. So those. So just like to save money in that and find a theater that's actually, you know, accessible to a mm-hmm. certain degree yeah. would help save costs. Yeah. Um, but. <sighs> What, what do you think? Well, I think, I mean, the question is who pays? Yeah. yeah. Right? Someone is going to pay for the SL interpreter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Someone is going to pay, someone should be paying for, yeah. you know, assisted living device, uh, listening, listening devices yeah. or the use of a describer. Mm-hmm. And the question is who pays? Is it the artist right. or the venue? Right. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe there's a third party. Right. Right. And what if the third party pays? Versus the venue who's, you know, yeah. who is, if you are a presenter who is feeling cash strapped, you know, yeah. and doesn't book a company because they can't afford the access costs. Right. Um, or, you know, what if you do yeah. separate? I mean, the access costs for artists cannot, I mean, that's, that's really, yeah. 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 Right. No, so actually. what if we, what if we do fund access separately through municipal right. sources yeah. or state sources? I don't know, but it makes sense to me that someone has to pay but it shouldn't necessarily be the artist. And if it isn't the yeah. venue, then the venue, you know, 
Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'll just add here a little bit that my yes. organization, Disability Arts NYC, has been thinking about public funding as the equitable location for access costs specifically. So, you know, we're advocating for the city, you know, or cities in general as a model to um, to pay for these kinds of costs um, uh, so that they, you know, uh, actually support disability artistry as it happens. And then, as you're saying, it doesn't come out of the accounts of the right. venue or the maker, right? The dance mm-hmm. maker. So, um, yeah, yeah, this is this is good to think through because yeah. not there's no model, right? There's no model right. where this is happening, and we need to build that and then and then show that it works. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, where do we think disability dance is going? Maybe in a larger sense, like what what. Uh, What's what's next? I mean, Descent for me, I'll say my experience of watching Descent was very much like this is, there's so much new here, right? The, mm-hmm. So many new experiences. Yeah. Um, you could come all three nights and have three different experiences because as we were saying, the, the audience position, the singular subject position of the audience member is totally decentered, right? So that means you can engage with the artistry. Maybe not even in, in co-presence, mm-hmm. right? That mm-hmm. you don't even need to be there in some ways, and that's a tantalizing possibility. It, you know, is, is some kind of virtuality <laughs> part of the future of disability dance, or mm-hmm. where do we think it's going? Wow. So, <laughs> so the question is, for me, the question is ever deeper, ever deeper into our histories and to our, mm-hmm. our form. Like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this, we know that there are sophisticated, nuanced disabled artists who are producing amazing work in a variety of different disciplines. We know that disability history in all of its intersectional aspects is complicated. It's going in all of those directions. It's going, for me, deeper and in this kind of cross-conversational way so that we can be embedded and in relationship with each other. And then I think the other question is then, Given all of that, how are we in relationship with our audiences? Mm-hmm. And then that that question for me is, how do we make that connect point so that someone who isn't necessarily familiar with disability aesthetics or culture or history or politics is in there? So my, my thing is to can make that connection part of the reality mm-hmm. so that it's mutually facing outwards and facing into the community mm-hmm. of, of artists mm-hmm. and workers. So it's going in all those directions. Um, I don't, I I believe we should be able to expand the conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we need to shut conversations down. Um, But I think it's going forward, you know, like once the the dam opens, Mm -hmm. first there's a trickle, Mm -hmm. and then all of this kind of like flood just gushes out. Mm -hmm. And then maybe there's a dam further downstream, Mm -hmm. and we sort of catch it and look for a while. Mm -hmm. But while it's flowing fast, it's just flowing, and Mm -hmm. we we go with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to find a way, like, what if we could excessively live stream yeah. a dance performance? Right. So right. that's one of the things that we're going to be thinking about. We have a residency at MPAC. We're going to be looking at, you know, what does it mean to do that? Can we mm. can we stream into places where, mm. you know, to, like, hospitals or inpatient right. facilities and structures? Right. Okay, how do we mm-hmm. reach people? Um, but I think it's going in this complicated direction that... that that almost any art form is going in, right? Like we would, if you would ask somebody working in the in the field of race and dance, you would say, "Well, where is it going?" Mm. And their answer would be as unclear and as fuzzy and as interested in all of those aspects. And I think the fact that we are at that point is is mm. is the departure point. We've reached a place to move on differently. Mm. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, you know, for um, we are artists tend to be more self-centered. You go into your room, you go into your space, you mm. make work. Mm. You don't think that way. You, you, it seems like you, when you start making a work, you're thinking about all of these other things simultaneously. Yeah. Is it legible on all these levels? I have learned to be, I'm learning, I'm learning to be that way, yeah. Yeah. So, so you're thinking about your audience simultaneously, concurrently, as you make work. Mm. And the access practices mm. as I'm making the work. Mm-hmm. And also an open studio. I mean, the first ramp rehearsals were in a mezzanine 
um, academic building, and so we were just in the in the administration building on the mezzanine. You know, we were just rehearsing on the ramp. You know, and the people were sort of flowing by on their way going to classes, and you know, so it, I mean, you know, the open studio is originally there was no studio. We were just in the hallway. You know. Um, which, which I mean, yeah. I think that was really interesting because it was an open process. It was a really open process of creation. Like right. People just flowed in and out. Even in the warehouse, you know, the doors were open and that meant that people just kind of like mm. stuck their faces in because... <laughs> Did people come in with their rollerblades? And <laughs> no, we didn't have to. But yeah, people stuck their faces in because yeah. it's an open door in a warehouse right. district. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's open. Yeah. It's open, and I, I think that currently that works for me. Currently that works for me. Um, but maybe for the next project we'll need to go into a dark space and close all the doors. And, but I, I do think the Descent was created in relationship. It was created in relationship for us, by us, in conversation. Mm -hmm. And not all of that conversation was perfect. It still isn't. And we're still in the conversation. Mm -hmm. It will grow and it will change as we learn more about people's access needs and how access grows and changes. So. It's not done. Mm -hmm. It's not done. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just not done. Yeah. Yeah. I want to remind folks that you can submit questions if you have stuff that you'd like to ask us um, and to use the hashtag disability dance artistry to share your thoughts so we can um, see them. But I, I guess, Janet, I want to ask you kind of the same question. You know, you've said you're learning about disability dance. I mean, you're um, you're relatively new to this, but um, how do you see disability dance fit into the like the larger field of, of mm -hmm. dance? I mean, you're in your role as associate artistic director here at New York Live Arts, do you see disability dance as a as you know as a promising new innovative force <laughs> in dance? Not to ask a leading question or anything, but <laughs> well, certainly I think for one, it's creating its own language, which which as a dance person, I'm always interested in yeah. whether you're disabled or not. You're making work and making choices and and, and finding solutions mm -hmm. for your ideas and a strong set of ideas being manifested on stage. So, and then for my, I hope, I think that um, disability dance can totally fit into the larger field of dance. It's movement-based, movement mm -hmm. in time and space. Yeah. It may be telling a story or not. Mm -hmm. And I would love for people to come and see work like Descent, um, not just out of curiosity, of, oh, what can an artist in a wheelchair do? But mm -hmm. to look at it as mm -hmm. a work of art, yeah. to look at it as yeah. a vibrant performance. Yeah. yeah. And and not yeah. put that, oh, I feel good as a human being. I'm coming to right. see right. Uh, someone in a wheelchair mm -hmm. uh, make work. Sorry, I, <laughs> why did I even say that? I'm, no, I'm so sorry. But, but that's no, very but much it, the, that's that's that part is, of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the point that we're turning around, right? right? Yeah. That yeah. is the point that we're turning around. Yeah. Right. And that is, we haven't really talked about how to engage audience expectations, but for many people who don't know about this yeah. field and are intrigued, maybe they see some good marketing, right? And they, <laughs> they some of the beautiful, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, think about the marketing for Descent. It was so stunning, you know, and I don't exactly know the full extent of the marketing campaign, but I could imagine that a lot of audience members just thought, let me go see that. But they had no idea, right? It's that yeah. it's that mindset that you have to contend with, right? And also maybe another reason why you don't necessarily want to do the feedback sessions where you get a lot of the pity stuff, right? Like yeah. so so thinking about theories of change, right? How do you just get to a point, as you say, where the the artistry produces novel forms of of new kinds of dance, right? As opposed to be as thought of in these ways that are, we still very much live with these expectations from audience members. Right, and, and like, you know, um, someone like Bill Shannon right. was also creating his own language and, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah. I don't know if Bill is online, but recently at the yeah. MPN conference, um, there was a dance off at the party. Of course, he won. He was like, <laughs> dancing his ass off. <laughs> Easily, right? Easily. And, and, and creating his own crutches, inventing a whole vocabulary. Yeah. And um, we're bringing him to our theater next season. Cool. And, and he, for that particular work, he lives in Pittsburgh now. He is uh, transferring his dance vocabulary to able-bodied dancers. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. What does it mean for Alice to transfer, um, you know, mm. Wow. your... Oh, hang on. <laughs> movement. Like, whoa. I don't 
Wow, or, I I, yeah, or even with, within disability as a category, right? I mean, you've talked mm -hmm. about mad dance, right? Right. Um, uh, yep. Neurodivergent dance, um, mm -hmm. underrepresented in the dance yeah. field, even within disability dance. So mm -hmm. um, what would it mean for you to, you know, use your choreographic approach to disabled bodies where the disability is actually not about the body, right? Which is the case for me and for, for other mm -hmm. folks. Wait, who, what is mad dance? Mad dance. So madness is a category that folks um, uh, uh, have inhabited as a, as a radical refusal of some of the medicalization of mental illness and um, psychosocial disability. Yeah. So, so a lot of folks who say, you know, I'm not crazy. Society is crazy, right? Like mm -hmm. I actually, and then, and you know, and there's legacies in the late latter 20th century of forced medicalization and forced institutionalization. Yeah. And, Hysteria. Yeah. So just so it's a, it's sometimes a part thought of as a part, sometimes not a part of, of the mm -hmm. disability rights and disability justice oh, movement, but um, I very much think of them as together. And and you know I've heard Alice say before, right? We there within disability dance. Let's not be too quick to say that all this work is super super rapidly evolving, right? We still don't yeah. have all these forms that could very much well you know blossom in the field. So so to me the question is also like, what could you do you know mm -hmm. with other kinds of disabled bodies and minds too with your technique? So. Let's just be, let's be honest about this, right? Let's say, like, why are we, why are we, in the dynamic of mobility impairment, and why is so much of the field about mobility impairment? And mm -hmm. you know, I don't know why we are there, except that one of the forms in which there's, you know, dance is about the legs and feet, and so you know, this is this is that this is the way that that conversation has come, and so we get into this. A question about ability of like what is what is what can someone using a wheelchair actually do or someone using crutches do because right. you know it, it's about that but when you think about what disability contributes as an aesthetic as its mm -hmm. own generative mm -hmm. force mm -hmm. then why wouldn't you look to a variety of different mm -hmm. impairments and forces and ways of being and so I've done some work in that regard and mm -hmm. I had a wonderful experience in Canada in Edmonton with a group that mm -hmm. is really the diverse in its, in its disability dance group and mm -hmm. that was a really powerful process because the process changed according like not just I mean it, it, the the diagnoses of, of people who participating was not important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what happened was the way impairment and experience both changed how we worked and changed what we did together and then changed the art form mm -hmm. so that that particular piece that, that I made there is in fact influenced by a, a variety of impairment and impairment cultures. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I think, you know, it happened to be me um, who made that piece, but mm -hmm. it could have been anyone and that's part of the work that needs to be happening here. We need to be seeing work made by people with different impairments, not just mobility mm -hmm. impairments, yeah. and we also need to see those artists on the stage. And so, yeah. I am, you know, yes, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. You know, you know, people with um, mobility, um, how do you say it? Impairments. Impairments. Thank yeah. you. You said it so many times. It's like a defiance. I'm gonna dance. I'm gonna fucking dance. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can we say that on stage? <laughs> 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 I mean, I love it. Sorry. Does that mean we have to have like, an explicit thing to this? We'll just... I invite it, what? Janet. <laughs> Bring it out. And, and you know... That is that, the defiance. Uh, that right? is the defiance. Right. It is, and it's always amazing that, um, to me, in the physical acts, Paralympics, pe you know, yeah. people who are... Say, you. Yeah. You can't move. I'm going to I'm going to freaking run yeah. and jump and, yeah. and whatever. Um, uh, and people madness is so interesting mm -hmm. to me. I always think right. artists have a have a seed of madness. So I think <laughs> whatever comes out of them must be very interesting. <laughs> and people who have other senses that are just uh, that are impaired some other senses come alive. People who can't see, people who yeah. can't hear. I always feel like, "Oh, I think I can learn something from them." Mm -hmm. They understand the world from a more profound angle than me. So the question is to take what impairment offers yeah. and to think through the aesthetic of it without replicating or buying into mm -hmm. the societal stereotypes that are, that right. are mm -hmm. oppressive mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. So 
for example, and and you know, like let's deal with the ability politics because this is where mm -hmm. I'm like I'm in I'm in I'm in trouble here, right? I mean, literally, my how so? Well, my principle says that in a world where we're talking about disability as an aesthetic and driving force, yeah. do we need to be able to have dance that is of extraordinary ability in order to right. speak back to? The mainstream dance world like what if we really right. made dance that was only about the eyes right that would be yeah. that would be just as much of an interesting as disability as aesthetic to me mm. as it is you know the kind of stuff that, that Laura and I are doing on right. stage so how do we mm, skip through push through shatter okay I'm gonna go shatter shatter the dynamics of ability and that kind of negotiation of ability as extraordinary virtuosity and then look down to see what it is that impairment offers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's so well said. Um, you're in the right place. <laughs> I'm in the right place. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I hope so. But exactly. F finding your own vocabulary so you don't have to make another concert dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not putting down concert dance. You don't have, we don't have to ha insist on artists making a work that mm -hmm. surprises us in yeah. every way they can just sit and move their eyes or or gesture or yeah. where is the expression where's the expression yeah, yeah. where's the communication yeah. is it like what if we really allow that to be our driving force versus yeah. why isn't this gesture interest let's right? i see so many performances where that's it you I'm watching someone sit on a chair and do this for an hour. <laughs> right, but okay. Well, I have but, ex different expectations of, of right. people uh, mm -hmm. in, with impairment, with, mm -hmm. with uh, motion impairment. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is the wonderful, we, they would say we're in this, right? So yeah. um, I performed uh, Victoria Marx's Dancing to Music, mm -hmm. which is for itself a radical piece because at the time she made it a piece about head movement. And it's majoritarily composed of head movement, up, down, right, left. And, you know, that was for her and that time and context a statement about that with the extraordinary physicality. But when you place that piece on a disabled dancer, what comes of that mm. was, and we, used, we took this on tour, and people would say things to us like, well, we know that you needed a break, so it was good that you did that piece with the heads to get the break. Mm. Or if you started the show with that, it'd be like, is that all you can do? And so what became a radical, <laughs> what was a radical intervention, the yeah. conversation of ability and dance, yeah. when it was performed by non-disabled dancers, was one set of things when you transferred it over to mm. disabled dancers, because it became about the limited notion of what the body can and cannot do. Yeah. Not, and, and we need to change the audience understanding and audience yeah. literacy, so that if it were a piece that were about, a, a dance film that were about the eye, or a dance film that were about the tongue, or a dance film that were about something that that doesn't involve like flying around ramps right because right. the exceptionality can also limit right the expect expectation of exceptionality is, is right. it can be a limit too right the idea right. that the yeah then there's ways that in in disability arts and and disability writing we name this you know the right. the way that disability dance is celebrated as like over oh, this so incredible incredible that actually becomes a way of actually limiting the artistry itself mm, exactly um, yes. you're just making me think that you know eye tracking software as an access technology is is really uh, like there's a lot going on in this field, right? For folks mm -hmm. who who actually move their eyes around a screen and get and their eyes get tracked, could I'm thinking, what would dance forms mean if the eye tracking technology could produce, right. Right. you know, a, a dance in in new kind of novel and there forms? We are. This, this is how a be... disability aesthetic mm -hmm. creates yeah. art without this kind of conversation right. about oh, she can only do the eye mm -hmm. it's it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It shifts yeah. the way yeah. in which we think about generating and creating work. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to see happen. That's what, um, so you asked about what the field, what does the field need next? Yeah. The field needs funders, presenters, and audiences to have access to the vocabulary and thinking that we're talking about here. We need greater literacy, literacy about disability culture and aesthetics so people aren't mired in ability. Yeah. Because right. ability will shortchange the artistry every time. Yeah. Right. How do you compare dance versus the other art forms? 
Interesting question. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's interesting why there's, um, uh, you know, performing arts first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But disability dance is a, in, especially in New York right now, is such a. Um, it, there's so much going on there, right? I mean, there are there's a lot of disability artistry in other disciplines, mm-hmm. but um, you know, there's wonderful theater happening. But disability dance, I mean, that, part of that is dance NYC, dance NYC right? NYC. Of course, thank you. It's not like oh, what could it be? <laughs> you know, like it's like there's there's intentional, amazing, strategic work that's happening, mm-hmm. and that is part of it. Um, but I also think the the forms of virtuosity, you know, the mm-hmm. standards of dance, disability yeah. is very clearly changing that up, right? So whereas as, um, you know, visual art, you know, doesn't often involve the body, right? The, the yeah. human form on display. So maybe disability dance is mm-hmm. um, the right. first to kind of model these changes. But, but um, just hearing today, yeah. don't just limit disability to right. the physical. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, and I think, and I think, <laughs> I mean, Alice's work is showing us how yeah. they, how all these different art forms do cooperate, right? Yeah. And, and I've been thinking a lot about disability um, in nightlife too, right? Like, what would it mean to make a <laughs> of DJ? You do. So I, I'm working on it. But, you know, this is what we've seen in Descent too, like right. how the sound, the miking yeah. particular parts of the ramp produces. Alice has, doesn't actually know this is the first time I'm telling her, but we filmed Alice um, doing so, a beautiful, stunning performance um, that only Scott and I, who's in the room, that, um, really got to experience as as, this, as the audience members live. But right. we filmed it um, on the staircase, this metal staircase in Gibney Dance. And I have been, <laughs> I've been playing around with making like beats, um, like whole like uh, <laughs> from- with the sound because. Brooklyn Club sound is like all these like metallic rim hits and stuff, and the you the the metal of your mm. chair on the metal of the stairs produces these like incredible sounds. And you know, so what would it mean wow. then to have a DJ doing that and having a live choreographer yeah. in a space, you know, and having you know mm. someone produ- an eye tracking technology producing the visuals for the party? You know what I mean? Like right. I think actually the the ways that disability could you know could expand art is is actually very much a confluence you know they all work together and they must because one um form will rely on one sense and you need to expand that and 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 work beyond the Mm -hmm. visual or the auditory um so yeah i think i think descent is a great piece for us to think through all these other potential innovations in the wings wow wow yeah yeah, we have to talk more. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so let me get to a question, a, a great question here um, from Rebecca Meehan. Um, she asks, how does Alice feel about working with younger people? What if um, these people do not have a physical disability? She says, I want my students to be exposed to her dancing, thinking, and experience. Hi, Rebecca. Yes, find me online and let's work something out. <laughs> love it. Yeah, it's that simple, I love right? It. Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah. That's simple, and yeah, yeah and, and and we were talking earlier about education, but um, you know there are instances I've heard, and I hope this isn't as widespread maybe as um, it could be, but um, you know education plans for disabled students, often called IEPs or individualized education plans, sometimes um, actually make accessible art um, education impossible because these are schemas, right, right. for naming very particular outcomes for how um, a, you know education system can be adapted for an individual body right okay. and sometimes the arts is imagined as having no outcome or no measurable outcome and therefore it actually gets completely cut out of an IEP for disabled right. students so New York you know a place where ex- art education you know is it, there's a major push for that to happen for all students in all public schools it needs to be in all public schools and also made accessible too so um, having disabled artists come into the classrooms you know this is stuff that you know teachers maybe can help ask and then we can Mm -hmm. see like what the what the department of education needs in terms of getting more sustainable like you know format for disabled dancers and artists in schools i don't know how this works right but there has to be a way for the artists to be in schools i mean we know that non-disabled artists Mm -hmm. go into schools yep so yeah right this is this is not an insurmountable thing the question is is it sustainable yeah over the long term and will the artists be paid properly and are the students getting equal access to arts education yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, totally. yeah. Mm-hmm. right cool yeah. we can yeah. do that yeah. yeah or at least we can start the conversation and hopefully that will happen yeah 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 so 
if there are any questions from the audience, uh, we're, um, I think we're starting to wrap up here. Um, but I want to just say, um, that, I mean, we said it at the top, and if you're just joining us, maybe uh, let me just set the scene again for us. So we're here at New York Live Arts with Janet Wong, who's the Associate Artistic Director, and Alice Shepard from Kinetic Light, who just um, finished a sold-out run of a production called Descent. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the last um, conversation in a series that Dance NYC, uh, an incredible um, dance service organization, um, has put on as part Part of their dance uh, disability dance artistry fund, but I should say it's not just um, this conversation series and the and the funding that made a lot of these. Uh, uh, performance is possible. It's the task force of the organization that supports the field, thinking about disability mm -hmm. equity. Um, and so these, per the, the, uh, Alice is the last dance maker in the series mm -hmm. to be part of this conversation. And in fact, this is the end of the last conversation we're having. Um, not all of these, you know, it's it's happening since last August, but August or July, since the summer. Um, and so uh, it's hard sometimes to think of them all together because they've been spread out. But okay. this has been amazing for the New York disability yeah. arts community to have these six companies come through and these conversations and all of the, the venues that, you know, have have learned and are supporting mm -hmm. disability artistry in this way. So um, I just want to say a huge, huge thanks to D uh, Dance NYC, Lane Harwell's incredible leadership. This is a perfect time because he's joining us <laughs> back at the table here. Um, but the whole staff um, at Dance yeah. NYC, uh, it's, it, you've just been a, such an important pioneer for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's just an amazing moment at the end of all of these conversations to say it's not the end <laughs> because we know that you will continue to to lead us and um and just to say uh, you know thank you for everything that you've done for for this conversation series well now i'm um <clears throat> i'm flustered and i'm ready i want to thank you all for being here um with us today and along for the whole journey as a colleague of mine says, um, has said about other experiences, this doesn't feel like uh, we should be self-congratulatory. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We shouldn't be just patting ourselves yeah. on the back about what we've accomplished. This cannot be the end. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. This has to be, for all of us here, a new beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm excited mm -hmm. that the beginning began on Facebook Live today, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because a conversation that has been happening locally needs to be expanded, um, and we need to be working in concert with those doing work across the nation and and beyond. Um, and so, I invite you all on Facebook Live to continue with us. The video uh, will remain on our Facebook page in perpetuity, and we will also post a version of the video with closed captioning on our YouTube page. Please continue the conversation on Facebook. Uh, please, uh, as I said at the beginning, please post uh, your thoughts and ideas about how to advance disability dance artistry using hashtag disability dance artistry. Uh, and um, thank you again for Janet for hosting us hear the small mm -hmm. studio yeah, audience and each each one of you um, thank you thank you thank you have a good night